Hello and welcome to My Security TV and our Tech and Sec Weekly. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm with My Security Media, and today we're going to be looking at aerospace and space. Uh, we're going to be looking at the resilient multi-mission space program with Rod Smith, the Starshot leader, and this is within the Intelligence, Surveillance, and Space Division of the Defence Science and Technology Group. We're going to move into our space program. I've been looking forward to this. It's taken a while. Uh, to get Rod on board, uh, but thank you very much for his time. And just as a very brief introduction, our last space episode was a couple of weeks ago where we spoke to Defence Tech uh, and we looked at the space launch capability and the rotating detonation engine research uh, going on at uh, University of Sydney, RMIT, uh, and a couple of others as well. And some news of the day on our space and defence uh, tech uh, website. NASA is, this is a, a staff written news uh, piece on why NASA is pushing into the commercial space sector. Uh, we've also got just today, news out today, that the SmartSat CRC has appointed a uh, former Australian senior engineer from NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. He's on as a chief research officer. Uh, and also we've got Chris Flaherty or Dr. Chris Flaherty, uh, who's writing a range of articles on this channel. Uh, the latest has been Space Warfare Maneuver. Uh, and he's writing with the My Space Warfare Analysis Lab, uh, sort of projected and forward-looking uh, articles. So without further ado, ado uh, Rod Smith, Resilient Multi-Mission Space Starshot Leader. Rod, what a title. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Chris. It is a title. It's a bit of a mouthful, so I appreciate that. Uh, Very good. Um, I, I must get a copy of your business card. It must be a good one to <laughs> hand out uh, if you're still using them. So, and as I mentioned to you pre-interview, I've been introducing you, but not actually knowing what the Starshot leader uh, sort of is. Uh, but I do like uh, the resilient uh, key word there, resilient multi-mission space Starshot. So we've got a range of slides. Um, maybe just walk us through. Maybe I'll start with this first one in the context of the background and your role and uh, within the DSTG. Oh, thanks for that. And hello, everyone, wherever you may be. Um, so as a, Chris mentioned, I'm Rod Smith. I lead the Resilient Multi-Mission Space Starshot program here within Defence. Uh, that's led by the Defence Science Technology Group, which, which is the science technology arm for Defence and National Security in Australia. And that's how, how we're leading this program. Um, I think we all know how important space is. Um, I don't think we'd be having this podcast today if we didn't have uh, access to space uh, systems. I uh, probably wouldn't be able to find my way home half the time without Google Maps or wouldn't be able to do my banking if I didn't have those timing services that are so important to syncing up so much of our national infrastructure. But of course, we all know how critical uh, space is uh, to defence and our national security. If you haven't read them, I'm sure you, most of you have, if not all of you, um, the Defence Strategic Update and the Four Structure Plan are really continuing the journey for defence in becoming increasingly a sovereign controlled and ultimately, hopefully, a sovereign developed capability here in Australia. So we want to be able to uh, move forward and deliver those trusted and resilient services um, to our warfighters into the future. And you can see there um, that statement strict, uh, directly out of the Defence Strategic Update 2020 that assured access to space is critical to ADF warfighting effectiveness, situational awareness and delivery of real-time communications information. And hopefully as I go through the Starshot today, you'll hear a bit more about how we're the Starshot Strategic Research Program. And by that we're meaning uh, Horizon 3, uh, future capabilities beyond the immediately currently uh, planned phases of capabilities, moving into future capabilities and how we're going to use s and to bring from concepts in space into capabilities into space through the future acquisition programs. So next please, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, already had a bit of context, uh, resilience comes into this as well, of course. Um, space is already congested, contested and competitive. And every time Elon Musk uh, launches something new with the Starlink constellation or somebody else, uh, OneWeb, if, when they get going again, we increasingly make it out of a congested environment. So there's a lot of stuff up there and being able to understand what that space environment looks like and uh, uh, the things that are orbiting around us uh, is important. But it's also increasingly contested and competitive. And so that's where particularly the resilience aspect comes into this, as we expect and already recognise that space is a war fighting domain and defence has stood up the space domain here, led by Air Force, as our, uh, with the Chief Air Force and the Senior Officer responsible for the space domain in Australia. And so that's really an important development for Australia and a recognition of how important space is um, and how critical it is to our defence operations. 
And I, without um, sort of jumping on forward, and I know there's a couple of slides yeah. here, but how much of an uplift uplift is going on uh, potentially? <clears throat> sorry, potentially percentage-wise from the latest sort of force review, and because it's it's obviously obviously not a new thing for Australia, but the key word I've been hearing and and we've been hearing is sovereignty, mm -hmm. and having that sovereign uh, launch capability uh, as well. Is this a sort of a key priority? Where would that be, and, and how much of that uplift is required? It's a lot. Um, I think uh, Prime Minister Morrison talked about a space economy um, yeah. of 12,000 jobs, $20 billion space economy. And defence is going to be a really important part of that. Um, we want to contribute to that, and we need to contribute to that um, overall space economy moving forward. At the same time, uh, in terms of investment, this is the largest investment in a, a program, I suppose, uh, $10 billion over the next 10 years and then more further out. And so we are significantly increasing our capabilities uh, in terms of people, in terms of expertise, in terms of future operational capabilities. I can't specifically give you a percentage, but I can, can say that the Starshot program itself within Defence Science Technology Group is looking to have around about 30% of our internal staffing and cash, uh, our allocation resources devoted to it within three to four years. Right. And how are you finding industry? Because we've, we've contacted uh, and we've been in contact, sort of, I'm seeing defence moving into the private sector. The universities are definitely there from research, but they're very specialised. You know, they're not large research teams, they're highly specialised teams. Mm. And other than, say, some of the, the, the space programs that we have, like Gilmore Space and a few of the other startups, how much are you seeing from industry or how much is required from industry? It's very sort of defence and university li driven so far. There's a lot mm. of commercial opportunities there. And as I kind of mentioned in the introduction, NASA's starting to commercialise mm. and we're We've been, spoken to Cleos Space, which is ASX listed, but uh, they're European based. Um, yeah, how, how much do you th see the opportunity there in industry and and what we're seeing in, say, Adelaide with the, the SmartSat CRC and, and that integration of, of industry as well? I know it's a hard, it's not a really clear question, no, no, it's a no. hard one to answer, but yeah, where do you see industry playing a role in the importance? Uh, um, Let's be clear, we need industry and we need to develop and grow that space industry here in Australia to meet obviously not only our national ambitions but our defence ambitions as well. And so we are absolutely um, committed um, to working and partnering with industry to deliver the, the Starshot, for example, and then obviously industry will then hopefully help them position for future capability oper um, opportunities as well, but also not just as part of defence, but a part of the national space sector, and that's why we're working really closely with the Australian Space Agency as well to try and um, provide an integrated view into government, I suppose, as best as we can, giving competing civilian and, and military um, missions. But through that and putting in place policy frameworks, putting in place initiatives, doing um, activities where we can demonstrate and bring space heritage and bring real space heritage, hopefully position industry to get out, not only for Australia, but even to the global supply chains down the track. Yeah, sounds like there's a, a lot to do still as well. Um, I'll move over to the next slide and uh, we've still got plenty of time as well. And if you've got some questions from the audience, uh, g'day Douglas, uh, he should be in Hong Kong. Um, if you've got any questions or specific questions, welcome to, to fire them in. Uh, yeah, just keep, I'll keep going with this one, Rod, Defence Innovation yeah. and S&T. Oh, thanks, Chris. So it's worthwhile um, um, mentioning here. In fact, I'll, I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll touch on your previous question as well. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do in this star shot is actually leverage off um, the uh, new space initiatives. You know, what's I mentioned, Elon said, plenty of others in Australia, Mariota, Fleet, a whole range of EOS, a whole range of companies that are already in um, doing um, activities and have got heritage already and, and have grown their capabilities. And so we really want to see defence being able to leverage the best of new space in terms of technologies and approaches. So that's really important to us as well. So I just wanted to, to yeah. cover off on that from the previous slide. Um, if you don't mind, I'll just do this one yeah, quickly. Okay. Um, so back in uh, May, uh, we launched a new defence science technology uh, strategy. It is not the DSTG uh, S&T strategy, it is Defence's S&T strategy, more together 2030. And under that, it's about really trying to change the way uh, we do business and the way we uh, deliver um, defence uh, S&T and innovation. Uh, the Chief Defence Scientist, Professor Tanya Munro, is the Defence Capability Manager now for Innovation and Science Technology. 
And in that strategy, we talk about trying to, fo to deliver focus, scale and impact. And what do we mean by that? We mean by focus, focus on defence's highest priority needs. By scale, we mean we recognise, we know we cannot do this all within government and we see this as a partnership between ourselves, between industry, academia and our international collaborations as well. And by impact, what we mean is from the beginning, we are looking at transition pathways and making sure that the focus, the needs that we're after is going to hopefully deliver our end or position us to make better decisions or position exemplar capabilities into our future um, operations. And then as part of that, it introduced this science, technology and research or star shot program, which is a series, there's eight initial star shots of which the resilient multi-mission space star shot is one of those. And so when I talk about 30%, it's across those eight programs within uh, Defence Science Technology Group. Um, but we are also looking at that, that's just our contributions. We're now looking at how we grow that and bring the star shot and in case, in my case, the resilient multi-mission space star shot into a sustained and dedicated program to deliver that impact at the end of the day. Nice. Well, now we know what Starshot stands for. That's the main purpose of today's episode. <laughs> very good. Uh, and that's obviously very broad, a focus, scale and impact. Uh, and I take it you're working on all three at the same time uh, as you just kind of work through. And, and again, just to sort of re reiterate for the audience today, this is defence focus. So this is obviously defence requirements uh, in this area. So, yeah, outside of our sort of other areas that we've dealt with with industry. Yeah, absolutely. Even though, as I said earlier, we do work very closely with uh, Space Agency yeah. and SmartSat, and I'll talk about SmartSat in a little bit of time. But um, so as you can see there from the slide, uh, this is the sort of uh, signature or the poster slide for the Resilient Multi-Mission Space Starshot. This program is sponsored by the Chief of Air Force as the Space Domain Lead for Australia. Uh, my boss, Andrew Seedhass, is the Lead Chief or the Senior Responsible Officer, and I'm responsible for defining, delivering, um, developing and uh, executing this program. So that is my job. Um, I think the, the, what you see there on the left hand side, the impact we're going after is those defence missions. We are looking for space services, trusted and assured space services in a highly contested operating environment being delivered direct to our warfighter. So you can see that we're looking at um, providing um, uh, uh, satellite communications, we're talking about providing um, P&T, precision navigation and timing services, and intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance or situational awareness services. So um, that data that you can collect from space, it can help you execute um, and undertake your um, defence missions. Um, we are deliberately focusing Starshot on smart small satellites. There are plenty of high-end capabilities. For example, in the SATCOM, there are the geostationary satellite communications. I'm sorry, yep. I'm for defence, I do use a lot of acronyms. Uh, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, high-end uh, commercial and military capabilities there. We want to look at blended architectures and using those new space approaches. So what can a low Earth orbit or a, a, a non-geo Constellation, for example, bring to um, the, the warfighter and delivering those effective services uh, into the future. So that's really where we're sort of focusing Starship on. And I suppose those would, they won't be up all the time. You'll only deploy them in sort of a battle environment as well. I take it there's various scenarios that you would be looking at. Um, actually, that gets back to your comment about resilience. Uh, yeah. We expect that there will be an element of sustained 24 7, 365 day a year. Um, services because our, our war fighters are always deployed uh, around the world and we need to provide yep. those um, services to them. But we also expect those things to be uh, able to be agilely adapted on as we go. So even potentially from orbit to orbit, we may want to change things for each orbit. Uh, we may need to replenish due to various um, activities or we might um, have a failure on one of our satellites we need to get a new one into orbit. So that's one part of resilience, that sort of uh, yeah. being able to have many dispersed and but also being able to replenish and also to agilely adapt as we go. So we're looking at all those elements of resilience and everything in between, if I put it that way. So it's a fairly broad remit uh, yeah. that we've got. And multi-mission as well, not just individual ones. We want to look at aspects of each of those missions on each satellite, for example. Very good. Uh, I've got a quick, I'll, I'll write the mm. question. We'll keep going. Mm. But it's things like uh, sort of machine learning and, and how these are, mm. you're sort of mapping this out, not just the roadmap, but sort of sort of not so much war gaming, probably the wrong term, but just gaming what, you, what the capabilities could be and how they 
uh, interact, uh, the interoperability, the interdependence. It's extremely complex, but I take it you would be applying, say, a defence in depth approach and a various sort of principles as to what you do with space. It's a, it's a sort of a domain that that crosses a bit like cybersecurity. Uh, it, it crosses all of those platforms of uh, law, uh, sorry, land, sea, and and air as well. Yeah, absolutely, and that's actually one of the challenges, of course, for all this. Yeah. It is ubiquitous in that sense of being able to, uh, you know, we rely on those services from space, and we rely on space services not only for when we're deployed offshore, but even onshore um, defence missions for, say, the flooding. Uh, yep. Yeah, if, if we had remote sensing satellites up there, we, we could potentially apply those to support our disaster relief operations, for example. Yeah. Uh, in, in as well. So yeah, it is a really complex multi-domain problem and to be blunt we're going to have to focus at some point in time in specific <laughs> yes. aspects of it. AI and machine learning will be one of those key areas. We want to look at um, that at the space edge as we're calling it. We want to be able to put those that sort of capability onto our satellites and dynamically change that as necessary to meet our mission needs. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be able to work with you guys. I'd be, I'd be too distracted. I want to sort of look at everything, hence why we do this program. <laughs> and this is kind of answering that kind of question here, yeah. uh, the exemplar resilient multi-mission space capabilities, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. And that is, we, we sort of had this concept of having a smart cloud of space because the users don't really care where the information can't come from. They just need it and they yeah. need it without necessarily even knowing they need it or even necessarily asking for it. We want to be able to provide and demonstrate exemplar small satellite constellations, not only in strong room ones, but also in co partnership with our um, coalition um, and regional partners where appropriate to demonstrate how we could deliver those services to our warfighter. And, and to do that, we obviously need to also know what the space environment, what's happening up there. So that's that uh, bottom left-hand uh, part of that diagram. And do you see that there's a real opportunity there for, there for Australia for those niche areas, say for the CubeSats and the like, and some of the very interesting work that's been coming out of some of the universities. We do need to specialise, uh, but it, it, that creates opportunity. It absolutely does. So there's real opportunity. We've been a certainly. I would. We are trying as hard to get this uh, moving as quickly as possible, and uh, we've been engaging with universities, industries for a little while now. Um, we're getting close now to getting some of the real building blocks in place that we can start to really build out our first exemplar missions that we're going to go after and start to seed and shape uh, those activities. And, and hopefully, some folk who are listening in have seen some of the information come out on Oz Tender, our tender uh, website, and have already um, submitted their, uh, their submissions as part of that. And we're looking forward to partner with you on this journey together. Very good. Okay. Yep. Sorry, Rod. Yeah, so, so here, this is the way we're, we're structuring our program at the moment. Um, we're structuring, first of all, around our actual uh, defence missions that we're going after, which is, you know, ISR, as I talked about earlier, uh, certainly uh, satellite communications and then space domain awareness. And then also we're looking at cross-mission themes, uh, resilience and autonomy. That's where, for example, AI will come into it. Not only AI and processing our sensors, but, for example, if we have a fault on our satellite, could we do AI techniques to actually rectify that fault rather than mm. waiting for this satellite to go quiet, looking at the data, trying to work out what's going on? Can we progress that onto the satellite in the future? Um, can we, if there's something coming at us, can that system autonomously determine that there might be a conjunction or an event where we may have two satellites hit each other and be able to do something on that, either through manoeuvre or some other mode that makes um, our systems more resilient? And then finally, um, we're looking at the um, actual missions themselves and the operations. So that's uh, the exemplar systems that we want to build and the operations that we want, want to undertake um, and the experimentation we want to do as part of that. And then also what we're calling space missions analysis, which is really about doing model-based systems engineering and modeling simulation to support not only this program, but also more generally our future space capabilities and being able to look at the mix and match and what various sensors and various capabilities might bring in and help us guide our investment as much as work out what's the sort of best constellation in the future, for example. And it's interesting, we're moving on to drones and drone detection next. Uh, it's that aerospace and then the space is very close. There must be a lot of sort of crossover and sort of modulization from these systems. What you might discover and apply in a space domain will then be applied elsewhere as well, particularly say the autonomous systems uh, and that machine learning. Absolutely. I think in fact, some ways it's more of a crossover from what we know now here in the air and yeah. land and, and a maritime domain and moving it into space because we are all on this journey together. We're fairly uh, sort of, a, in a sense, we're a lot of startup 
yeah. for the national space sector. Um, I'm sure some people will say, no, we've been in space for a long time, and I certainly agree with that, but certainly there's a lot of SMEs out there, there's a lot of new companies coming to the fore, a lot of companies starting space activities. Um, and we can bring a lot of that expertise that already exists and see how well and what's applicable to space domain and what's new and then we can go after those research problems in the what's new space. Yeah, very interesting. Mm. Uh, and the other thing we always look at is the security, the cyber security around this is critical, yeah. uh, not just on protection of the research, but uh, also the way that the systems operate. Um, yeah, this one, the strategy. Yeah. Yeah, so this is really what we're our sort of four pillars that we've put in place, uh, not stove pops, pillars to um, uh, deliver us the Starshot. We obviously have some really good relationships with the international research community. We've been working with them for many years, obviously within defence circles, but also more broadly, and we're looking to leverage off those. There's also the sorrows of the world and, and those as well that can help in that area, for example. Um, the SmartSat Cooperative Research Centre, as everyone knows, has been established a couple of years now. Um, Defence is the second largest contributor to the SmartSat Cooperative Research Centre, both in cash and in-kind support. And so we fund our uh, investment in the SmartSat CRC to do this high-risk, um, high-payoff technology development through our Next Generation Technologies Fund Space Capabilities Theme, which is headed by uh, Dr Nick Stacey, my colleague. Um, then, then actually, we actually only had three um, in, initial uh, delivery um, uh, pipelines or, or um, pillars, but uh, we got some feedback earlier on that we needed to have a separate opportunity there just explicitly for industry and academia that may not be coming through the SmartSat CRC yeah. because we were looking for novel technologies and novel ideas and also people who for their own reasons want to um, not necessarily be a uh, part of the SmartSat CRC. So we added that in a couple of months into the Starshot in the middle of last year to say, hey, you know, you don't have to all go, we don't have to all go for the SmartSat CRC. We want to be adaptable here and, and take advantage of everybody's um, good ideas. And then the final one, which I cannot talk too much about, which is our strategic partner, uh, that we're in the right in the middle of doing a tender evaluation to select a, a strategic um, partner in space systems integration to help us deliver those exempt permissions into the future. And so um, apologies to everybody, I cannot um, give well, we'll you an exclusive keep, today, we'll Chris. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, you'll have to wait a, a little bit longer for that one. We'll, we'll definitely try to have you on once that is released. Yeah. Um, how much, uh, we had the advanced manufacturing uh, growth centres and the range of sort of innovation centres uh, that the Australian government has had. Have you had much to do with those as well? And I know that they did have a number of uh, sort of space related programs as well. Do you, are you satisfied that everything's feeding sufficiently into each other from this innovation? Um, Yes and no. I'm satisfied that we've reached out a fair bit and we've had a range of conversations as much as we can and we continue to do that. Um, I do think though that there's been a little bit of a hiatus between that initial reaching out last year and trying to get this star shot really going because the next step is of course is to come with, hey, here's our plans, what do you think, get it, everyone uh, fully engaged and make some decisions and that'll be the next stage that we'll be moving into fairly soon as we get that once we get a strategic partner on board then we'll be going as quickly as we can and and, and really re-evaluating where we're at yeah well at least you're working to a clear strategy it's uh, there'll be a lot of noise in this space for you uh, and as well you don't want to miss those opportunities when you see some or there is a good piece of research yeah. that you potentially miss would probably be worst case scenario as well so, exactly. yeah, we'll finish up on this one, and this is the potential roadmap uh, over the next decade. Uh, it's a fascinating decade moving forward. And Rod, just brief, briefly, what's your background? Where did you come from for this role? So I was a group leader in Defence Science Technology Group. I've spent most of my career, career in uh, Defence Science Technology. I did spend a little bit of time in uh, Russell in headquarters in, in Canberra working in the intelligence community at the start of my career uh, in what's now AGO, the Australian Geospatial Intelligence Organisation. So that's, Got it. that's my... I had a science degree. Um, I did uh, meteorology and oceanography. Would you believe? And so yeah. it's a lot of time to get remote sensing data and, and the environment and those sort of things. And it, it just went from there, I suppose. Well, I suppose that's, you know, again, my background. Once you get to a certain age, and sorry to show my age here, but uh, now looking out to the next decade, how exciting is this in terms of what you're seeing and the speed uh, of development? Yeah. It's really exciting. For me, yeah, this is great. I mean, I've been a space geek for many years. Uh, my name was uh, microprinted onto the Perseverance rover, uh, <laughs> along with 11 million others. Um, so that's there on Mars until someone collects and puts it in a museum somewhere. Um, but uh, it's really, it, it is exciting. I'm really, this sort of is one view of the Starshot. This is a view about 
um, our potential indicative satellite mission program. So we're going to, and looking at increasing complexity through that. So maybe getting one up initially and then eventually moving to a multi resilient multi mission autonomous satellite constellation to demonstrate that it's ample capabilities. Um, doesn't mean we won't be doing other things along that journey and in other activities. So please don't take this as being a set in stone yeah. or even encapsulating all of the activities we're going to do. Um, and we're really trying to move from that bottom left of, uh, you know, we've done a few um, uh, with Union New South Wales and Air Force, we put up a, a CubeSat called Buccaneer, a risk mitigation mission. Our main one's going up next year. Um, Air Force is doing the M2 program. There's a few others going on in, in industries now and uh, go other governments as well, other government agencies. But um, we want to move from those sort of CubeSats to say around about uh, the small satellite, the micro satellite, 200 kilogram class as part of this program. So we really want to do a step change in Australian capability because we we expect that that's going to be a spot that's both affordable and, and realistic for Australia to be able to aspire to within the next five to 10 years, as well as being able to um, deliver enough military capability and provide military useful capability into the future in a sort of disaggregated um, space um, concept in the future. So we really see us as being, um, I suppose, the custodians, of, uh, one of the custodians of trying to drive the Australian space sector into, uh, along the way that would help it position much better for future defence um, capability options and being part of those programs. Nice. One one thing that has come up on our previous episodes is also the sovereign launch capability and when we would expect to start to see sovereign launches taking place. Uh, one milestone is 2024 or thereabouts. Is that about right? Um, so sovereign launch is really good. Uh, we've had many discussions with various uh, folk, the Gilmore folk, um, with the various ranges as well, and, and the others are looking at um, space launch in Australia. I. This is my personal view. I cannot imagine a resilient space capability for defence in 10 to 15 years' time without some ability to do sovereign launch. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, defence is still uh, developing its defence space strategy uh, that's being led out of the Air Force headquarters at the moment, and we hope to have that uh, out by the middle of the year. Um, and we don't currently have launch per se as a research activity in the Starship, but I need launch. Wouldn't it be great if my first mission on 2024 is launched on Australian uh, from Australian soil on Australian launcher? Yep. Uh, and and that would just be a fantastic outcome, I think, if we even get to that. Okay, well, we'll we will uh, sort of mark 2024 as that. I know a few of the industry that we've talked to uh, definitely want that. Uh, we've had South Australia, Northern Territory and Queensland uh, as uh, potential sites or select sites. So we'll definitely be monitoring that. Um, look, so thank you so much, uh, Rod Smith, the star shot leader, and that's science, technology and research uh, uh, shot. And that's what they're aiming for with uh, the Intelligence, Surveillance and Space Division in Defence Science and Technology Group. It really is an as a fascinating area and we've given it a good uh, sort of half an hour. We'll keep the audience wanting more. And after that tender is comes out and the, the nominations have been selected, uh, we'll, I hope to have you back on. So thank you, Rod, so much for that. Um, and appreciate the Thank slide you. deck as well, mate. Very, very interesting. And there's no questions from the audience. So uh, we're going to let you go for and enjoy your afternoon. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening. Please appreciate your time. Thanks again. Bye. See you Bye. later. Bye-bye. And the report of the day. This has just come out practically, I think it was yesterday. This is the Global Britain in Competitive Age, the Integrated Review of Security, Defence, Development and Foreign Policy. And as uh, we started off uh, with part one today, looking at the Force Posture Review 2020 from Australia, this is pretty much the same type of approach. These are the main points for the Indo-Pacific. Uh, renewed focus on the Indo-Pacific from the UK, uh, working more closely with Australia. Committing to deploy HMS Queen Elizabeth Carrier for the first time in 2021 to lead a British and allied task group to the Indo-Pacific demonstrating uh, interoperability with allies and partners and ability to pro project cutting edge military power in support of NATO and international maritime security, increasing economic, uh, sorry, economy wide investment in research and development to 2.4% of GDP by 2027 and increasing spending by 24 billion pounds over the next four years, comfortably exceeding NATO target to spend 2% of GDP on defence and the biggest investment in defence since the end of the Cold War. So that is on our space and defence channel. You can grab a copy of that. Uh, and I have reached out to the High Commissioner, the British High Commissioner to Australia, 
uh, just to see if she'd be interested in coming on and discussing with us. Uh, please check out and support the channel. Uh, go to the MySecurityTV.shop, check out a range of merchandise there. And looking forward to the next Tech and Sec Weekly on Friday morning. We'll be streaming at 10 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Daylight Saving Time. We're going to be joined by Anna LaBelle and Claire Pales uh, looking through their secure board book launch. Uh, and we should have a book giveaway as well, I hope, and um, doing a bit of a book review. And then we'll be joined by Lani Refferty, the Regional Director with Clarity, and looking at the smart meter, particularly the Schneider Electric. Clarity uh, have identified a couple of uh, vulnerabilities and exploits in the Schneider Electric smart meters. And, we'll, and Lani is well known here in Australia on uh, IoT security and vulnerabilities. So looking forward to that. So that's it from us at the Marketplace. Uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks for joining us on our Tech and Sec Weekly.